one of my wife's kind of things that she slightly makes fun of me with. It's okay. She's not dishonoring or anything. Don't get the wrong idea. But one of my phrases that I use is the other day. And the other day can be anything from four days ago to four years ago. It's just, it's just the other day. So, the other day, something happened. Apparently, to, to some people, the other day has to be within like ten days of, of now. It's closer, but it's for some of us, I'm just trying to define it for you so that if I say something, you kind of get a... You can have a better picture of who I am. So the other day, within the last four years, we had something happen that was, to me, uh, beautiful. It was a very rough story. A young woman that kind of grew up in church. I know some of you here, you, you grew up in some sort of church, even if it wasn't this one. Most, I would say most of us here, that's our story. We didn't grow up somewhere else. We grew up going to church. It might not have been a good church. It might have been a good church. But we've had the privilege of being, of having the kind of parents that loved us enough that made us go to church. Yeah. And I know I worded that very carefully because some people don't like it that we make our children go to church. I can't think of anywhere else I would like to make them go. Because <laughs> like I was saying last night, one of these days... And I don't even know how that all works. I think it's kind of like when the water was moving. That's a weird story also in John. When there was a lot of sick people around this pool and the water would shake. And their story was that an angel would shake it. And the first person to the water would be healed. And we all, since we all grew up reading the story, we're like, yeah, that's what happens. Have you ever thought about that? That's weird. And then I think, yeah, but if Jesus were to come there, he would have healed them all. It's been a while since you read it, hasn't it? <laughs> he shows up to this one dude laying on a pallet thing and says, hey, would you like to be healed? And he's all frustrated. So he did the thing that I was telling you. When you and God are alone, please don't do it when we're around. Okay, I'm, I'm begging you. We don't want to hear all your garbage when you and God are having it out. I want to think better of you than that. But apparently other bodies heard this guy talking to Jesus and he goes, well, you know what? I would like to be healed, but now for these like, I can't remember, was it 30 something years? I can't remember how long this dude had been laying there. Yeah, I don't have anybody to help me. And the water, water starts shaking. Yeah, somebody gets in there first and here I am still sick. And Jesus was like, okay, Let's go back to the original question. Would you like to be healed? That was kind of a yes or no question. I don't want to hear all that. Thank you for telling me your life sob story, but I asked you if you wanted to be healed. Many times when God speaks to us, He speaks like that. Would you like for me to do this? And we're like, yeah, but you don't understand what I've been through. And I can only see Him raising His eyebrows. I know I, these guys speak English, right? Yeah, I'm talking English to you. Do you want me to help you? And we're like, well, see, I would have. <laughs> and we start copping an attitude toward God. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Sometimes when we come up for prayer, in our thoughts, we're like, well, I've been up for prayer 62 times over a period of 8 years, 4 months, and 12 days. That's not the question. Wow. Do you want to be healed? 
And when you come up, are you coming up in faith? Or are you coming up to just prove one more time that it don't work? I'll have to challenge some things because I also grew up in church. I would dare say, with the exception of a couple of people in here, I've been to church services more than anyone in here. Probably not more than Brother Rhodes because he's done a lot of church meetings and he's considerably of more age than me. So I'll catch him one day. <laughs> but that day is not today. He's got me beat today. And the whiter your hair is, the longer you've been in God, you probably still have me on a couple. But Anyway, when Jesus told the dude he could be healed, he walked off. We just heard the guy say, and the others get there before me. What's my point? My point is, we must not know Jesus very well when we just assume that he would have healed everybody if he had been here. That's not necessarily true. I don't know the rhythm that God moves in yet. I'm working on that. But let's get into it. Let's try to figure it out. Let's try to get in step with Him. When God moves, let's us move. The Israelites, while they had some things about how they had to do it, that maybe, you know, killing cows to get myself to feeling better about God, I, I, you know, that was kind of a rougher time to get your sins taken care of. But at the same time, when they're walking through the wilderness, they just kind of open their tent door. <clears throat> okay, pillar of fire still there. We're good. Okay. They had a visible sign that they could look at. When I was driving up to the church, I, I didn't see it. Did, do you all get the pillar of fire often? No? No? Okay. Okay. Good. I didn't see it either. I was hoping I wasn't the only one that didn't see it. You understand what I'm saying? In some senses, the way they had it then kind of was easier. In other senses, they're walking around in the desert for a long, 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 long time. It's not Virginia. Virginia is a very nice place. The Sinai Desert is not as nice of a place. No McDonald's. No McDonald's. So we had a young woman that grew up in church. And through the process of time, as happens, as you've seen, People get disappointed, or they get disillusioned, or they get confused, or they get just outright ornery. And then they begin to drift in and out. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't come. Sometimes you come, sometimes you don't come. I don't know who we are, so. Her family started getting like that, just kind of shaky, and one of her brothers really turned away from God, went off into the city, uh, Ended up in some bad deals. Wow, he's, he's just bad off. Ended up getting AIDS. She ended up marrying an unbeliever. And she went from being a young girl who just was just pure of heart to a bitter young woman who began to drink, who began to just be violent with her husband and just, wow, it just got bad. And my wife and I knew her as a child and we would see her and we'd be like, how are you doing? And she was just like almost mean. And be careful when you walk away from God because your spirit likes to be with God. And when, you're, when you allow yourself to walk away from God, you create confusion in here. And you don't always know who to blame. So you just kind of get mean to everybody. Wow. <clears throat> this was her for like 12 years, wasn't it? For like 12 years. 
she just kept getting worse and worse. She was having health problems. I think she went through a miscarriage. She just, it was just one of those deals where the story is just not getting better. And the pastors would go to her and she would cry and repent. And then the next week she's back and going the other direction again. She would come to church one time and then she was gone again. And then it was just in and out, up and down for like 12 years. And then she had, uh, she had gotten gallstones. She had went to the doctor and just full of gallstones. And they wanted to do surgery on her, but she and her husband didn't even have the money for the bus fare to get to where the hospital was that would do it. And she started drinking more and more. And she got so violent when she would drink that her husband, who has never been a believer, he's just a good, hard-working dude, but he's never even claimed to be a believer. He likes to be a pagan, but he's not like a, a bad person. Some, this unbelieving man looked at her one day as she was just drunk, and he said, I fear that you're going to kill me or one of the children. He's like, and I shouldn't be the one to have to tell you this. He said, but you need to go get right with God again because I don't like this woman that I have now because you're going to kill me. Let me just clue you in on something. When the unbelievers are telling you you need to get back right with God, you went too far. (laughs) They know who they are and they know who we are. And when we step out of where we're supposed to be, we go zooming past them so far they get afraid of us because we're out there into wicked land. They're just normal land, which is not necessarily with God. They're not, it's, it's not going to go well for them necessarily, but they're just kind of trying to figure things out and people talk to them about, they see a Christian, they're like, okay, that's what a Christian looks like. Hopefully that's a good example. And then all of a sudden they see one of us heading towards darkness and they're like, whoa. And that's where he was at that moment. He was, she was so far into bitterness and hatred and sin that he was almost like in the light compared to her. And he was like, hey, honey, can I go get your pastor? Is that okay? Please don't kill me. That's where she was. And the pain in her gallbladder was so bad that she was continually had to be bent over like this. And one day she took her kids to school just like this. And even the school teachers are like, you need help, lady. Okay, when the whole community comes and tries to be like, hey, we love you, maybe, do you want to get help? You need, you know, to take you to your pastor? How's this going to go? It's almost like an, a community-wide intervention going on here. Well, she kind of woke up. She went to her pastors, weeping. She's like, I think I'm going to die. And they said, let's pray. Because pastors seem to think that praying works. I've met a bunch of pastors and they all got the same answer. You walk into the church, I got a problem. Let's pray. Like that works or something. The gall of them to think that praying to God works. Wait, what? Exactly. It doesn't seem like it would do anything, but it does. The pastor's wife is there, and she was telling me the story. And she's like, she's not bigger than a minute. She's a little person. Not like the politically correct thing. She's just small. And she's like, all I did... Like she's trying to convince me that she didn't do this before she tells me. It made me kind of suspicious. <laughs> she's like, look, I didn't do it. And I'm like, just tell me the story. She said, I put my hand upon her forehead. And she said, it looks like I hit her with a car. 
because she just had barely touched her. They were gathering her and her husband and a few other believers in there. They were going to get to doing some serious praying and break this stuff off of her because she's finally coming and it's, you know, for like the 40th time to repent. And they're just, but they, see, the thing is, they never gave up on her. When she would come in, they would receive her in, they would pray with her, she would repent, and they were, you know, it was frustrating, but they never just told her, look, just go away. And I'm asking you, with the people in your life that you've seen come and go, and they just look like they're never going to get it together. And you know what? They may never get it together, but they never need to be able to say, I went there and they rejected me. Like I told you this morning, make it difficult to go to hell from this county. Don't just count your town. Let's just take in the whole county. I've even got something boiling inside of me that I think that where there's a body of believers that, that I believe that when we begin to truly walk close to God that we can chase sickness out of areas. Now you don't hear about that much and you don't see it much. Brother Rhodes was telling me that in some cases he's seen that in churches. But I say let's get it out of the church even. That's right, brother. We're talking about the God of heaven here. Yes. He's not limited in, in the sense of he can't do it. But he's chosen to, to go through us. We limit him. Mm. Anyhow, this sister doesn't limit God so much. She touches this young woman. And she said she just went like a felled tree. She didn't even check up. She was gone. Like, conscious, unconscious. She said, I thought I killed her. <laughs> so they rushed down there and kneeling down. God, did we kill her by praying for her? What happened here? Because she doesn't seem to be breathing. She doesn't seem, it's like she, they said, we are not sure she didn't die. We, they were checking for vitals and this. You know, it went from, yeah, we're going to cast the devils out of her and pray for her to, Oh, I think we killed her. <laughs> that changes kind of the, kind of breaks the, the mood a little bit. Is she dead? I I can't remember how long it was. It was three hours? Three hours. My wife remembers. That's why I have to bring her around so I can. Three hours. She seemed to be dead. They said she was faintly breathing, just like she was just like barely alive. When she came to, she's just weeping. Weeping. And she got up on her own. She wasn't bent over anymore. And they said, Are you okay? And she's like, I am now. When they touched her, she saw a hand come through the ceiling. Wow. And a hand, this hand opened her up from up here down to here in kind of a weird way. And this hand reached in and pulled out these braids and beads and different things that our pastor told me later that he recognized as the type of witchcraft that's in that area. Like just this mat like a braid of hair, like a woman would have a long braid of hair and it was from here to here. And they didn't see this. This was happening, I guess, in the spirit. But she saw herself being opened up like open surgery. And this was a three-hour process. And she's watching this thing is working and pulling things out of her and out of her. And all of a sudden, it's like the hand sealed her up and she heard a voice and said, Be careful. Your wound is healing still. And then she wakes up and everybody's standing around her like, Are you dead? <laughs> you know, and she's like, Oh my gosh, I was just open. And she checked and they could not visibly see. There's not a scar. There's nothing like that. But the voice told her to be very careful. And so they told her, You need to observe what the voice said. And so she was very careful. But the bitterness and the hatred and, and the sickness and everything was gone. Like she transformed from being a, a bitter, very angry young woman to she can just weep and she, can, she has a smile. She's... 
that just blew my mind. Because I was like, so God did some kind of soul surgery? I don't know. But it, it, it healed her physical body as well. But her mind and her spirit, everything was fixed. Now she goes to church and her husband's happy and he comes sometimes. He's not fully in yet, but I think we're going to win with him. Because he was witnessing to his wife and he don't even know Jesus. <laughs> That's so amazing. God does what God wants to do. Amen. What I want you to do is I want you to begin to talk to God and say, God, teach me how to understand how great you are. Don't be entrapped in your hurts and your pains and, and your, your, the mud that we create. There's a way to let God be God. Like he was saying earlier, we're not yet in the presence of God in the sense that we're going to be one day. We're on earth. As the scriptures say, we're in this world, but we are not of this world. And therein lies the problem is we get confused sometimes and we start walking as the world when we're supposed to walk as citizens of heaven. I love that part when Paul's like, we are citizens of heaven. It's almost like we have a heaven passport. People often ask me, where are you from? They don't take really kindly when I say heaven. So I try to make it lighter on them. People try to corner me. What's your favorite place on earth? Mm, I've been seeing a lot of it. And so far, I like the whole thing. Other people tell me how bad it is here on earth. And I tell them, no, no. In Genesis, when it said that God created the heavens and the earth, it says he made it very good. It didn't just use the word good. He said it was very good. And when God thinks something is very good, it must be really amazing. We have the wrong thing going. We complain about stuff that's new. Don't. The Israelites complained a couple times and fire broke out. Fiery serpents are coming. Let, let's, let's don't be drawn in this, the fire and the fiery serpents. Let's, let's stay away from that stuff. I don't believe that was just myths that, that were written in there. I believe those are real fiery serpents that come after them. That, that you don't need that in your life. Stop calling on it. Right. The earth is very good. If there's something wrong with the earth, we did it. Okay, moving on. I'm not preaching some kind of ecological deal. I'm just saying. If the earth is broke, don't be blaming God. John chapter 8, verse 1, I'd like to read. Jesus went into the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. See, they were starting to learn some things about Jesus. As he didn't really always play ball. And I know some Christians take that and they act like they want to act like Jesus and they get into rebellion and it gets stupid. That's not what I'm talking about. Well, Brother Jody said, that's not what I said. I'm saying they were learning about Jesus and they were trying to figure out a way to trap him. To make him look like the bad guy. 
So they bring him a lady they had caught in adultery. It raises various questions to me, one of which is, where's the dude at? We don't know. But obviously this was a political move and it was a one-sided story and it was all kind of weird stuff going on. Because God said we could kill her. And Jesus is like, I don't even have time for this. You know, I just read it to you. It didn't say that, but that's, can you imagine Jesus is like looking at him like, and he's just drawn on the ground, which is unusual also. (laughs) I've, I've pointed out a few things about Jesus to you that you may or may not have picked up in the most people's way they read the Bible is in such a religious way that any anomalies would just cast them aside as if we didn't just read that. But I find it really peculiar that when we're, we're dealing with a life and death situation here and Jesus is just drawing on the ground, I presume there were children, or I don't know. I don't know what's going on, why we were drawing on the ground. That's not normal, I guess. To me, it doesn't seem normal. <coughs> Excuse me. When they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Again, this is not some secret verse that nobody's ever preached about. We've all heard 18 variations of this. Now this will be number 19. It's just interesting that how the people in that time and us at this time, like I said earlier, use yourself as the reference point. We use the law against people, not for people. They used the Sabbath day against people, and Jesus said, y'all got it all backwards. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. And so when we read the scriptures, we're always trying to read the scriptures in an effort to figure out how to make everybody else fit what I want. And when we read the scriptures, we ought to be looking here. And I've said that like ten times since I've been here. Because I think that's a key thing that we need to do right now. That's right. We need to love everybody else. And if you're going to fix somebody with the scriptures, fix you. And I say you when I'm looking at me. I have to fix me. Really the reason we're talking about it is because I was asked to speak. And I think this is a good thing to talk about. I'm not really trying to fix you. I'm trying to make you aware that sometimes we need to get our radar not looking this way. You understand that there's Holy Spirit, right? Yes, that's right. And He's teaching people and He's working with people and He's got it. Not that we don't need to encourage them and help them. And even at times, Paul talked about rebuking people. I got that. I got it. However, when all of our concern is on everybody else and we never figure out if we're without sin, I think sometimes. We, we, we make mistakes that way. He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst... I heard a guy preaching about this and he said he had read some Jewish writings and according to, it's not written here, but in the history, apparently Jesus was writing about, he would write a sin and then he would look at the person. That's, I mean, why would the eldest leave from the eldest to the youngest? There's something was going on that we're not seeing. So I kind of believe that's possible. It's not scripture. Don't say that I quoted that as scripture. But something was going on to where he was looking at the person. He's like, if anybody don't have any sin, go ahead and pick up a rock and chunk it. And then they said that it seems like that he was writing stuff and then looking at them. Like, I'm not going to say this out loud, but me and you know that you can't cast a rock. 
And that person was like, yeah, I've got to go check on the cows. (laughs) And all of a sudden, there's no accusers there. There's the crowd, but not the not the gang that was trying to get this lady killed. We're not talking about hearsay. We're talking about there were witnesses. She was in sin. They have the right by the law that was given to Moses to have her stoned. This was legit. As we say, she was dead to rights. It's over. There's no getting out of this. This isn't a perhaps, this isn't slander, this is this is the real deal. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned you? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Like I said, I've heard this sermon, this passage preached maybe 18 times. I don't know, I'm guessing on that number. But the other day I was reading this passage, and I'm seeing that Jesus forgave her. Do do y'all get that, that Jesus forgave her? Because he was potentially the one that could have thrown a stone at her. He was the one without sin. I feel like he forgave her. Is this not what y'all feel? Okay. It's a trick question. When did she admit to sin? Thought so. That's what I thought. When did she repent? We're going to have to strike this passage from the book. (laughs) Or we're going to have to understand that God moves sometimes outside of the traditional ways. I'm not saying in any way that it's okay to sin. And I'm not saying it's not okay to repent. I'm saying you have to repent. I believe you must repent to be born again. What I am saying is God sometimes shows mercy upon whom He will show mercy. He chose in that moment to not embarrass her any further. She had been publicly humiliated for having done the sin that she was accused of. And he said, I've decided not to accuse you. I'm going to ask you one thing though. Stop. Which is basically what repentance is. According to what I understand, I don't know the Greek word, but what I understand of that particular word, it means to be going this way, and you change and stop, and you go this way. Repent does not necessarily mean getting up in front of everybody and say how much of a bad person you've been. Amen, Amen. It can be that. And if you feel like God tells you to do that, then you need to do that. But I shouldn't require that of you. Yes. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. We make it so difficult to get into the kingdom of heaven. And I rebuke us. Because we're guilty of that. We make it so hard to be a Christian that we've made it to where nobody wants to be one anymore. I'm not talking about letting someone live a liberal life with no standards and all that. I'm saying that when sinners, they don't feel welcome in the house of God. Jesus was having that problem with the Pharisees. He said, constantly, he's like, I'm going to go talk to the sinners now. Oh, you must be a sinner. (laughs) It's just, this passage just kind of... I would say I wouldn't, wouldn't be religious. I would look at you and say I'm not very religious. But when I read that passage, I'm like... 
Lord, you didn't bring her to that point of decision. You didn't push her to the place where she felt so bad. She was crying. You simply forgave her. You can't do that. If you remember the fellow that they broke the roof and let him down through, the four men, destruction of property, breaking and entering, all kinds of laws are being broken here. Because they're trying to get their buddy healed. They're just ripping the tiles off and everybody's like, we'll fix it in a minute, it's okay. They let him down, expecting a healing, and Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Again, uh uh-uh. I didn't hear where the paralyzed man said, Lord, I know I'm laying here paralyzed, but could you forgive my sins? Because I've been bad. It's not recorded that he said anything. He was just kind of helplessly being carried by the friends because he can't do nothing. They lowered him down and Jesus is like, you know what? You need a good dose of forgiveness. You know what? I'm, I feel like forgiveness today. And everybody's like, in their thoughts, who in the world did we ask to come talk at church today? <laughs> Whoa. Nobody can just... Oh. We should have never invited that Nazarene fella. Mm. I told him. And he's like, okay, I got it. I'm not supposed to do that, right? Watch this. Get up and walk. The dude gets up. He's like, hey, this is cool. Jesus is like, get your bed. Don't forget it. Go home. You're done. Then you are done. You don't even have to listen to the rest of the sermon because you're healed and your sins are forgiven. You're done. Everybody else needs to stick around. Y'all got some more work we got to do. Who does Jesus think he is? And in the next breath, we say, Make me like Jesus. Okay. If I'm going to be like this fella, I got to do a little more learning what it means to forgive. Mm. He's got us trapped. There's no way out. Except through forgiveness. He even made a clause at the end of the Lord's Prayer, which most people don't quote that part. When we get to thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen, we stop. We stop praying, we stop reading, we don't want to see the next phrase. The very next phrase, because he was like, as he's praying, and then Father, as we forgive our debtors and forgive us our debts, and then he's like, amen, he goes, oh yeah. By the way, guys, maybe you're not aware of this, but if you fail to forgive, I know we just left prayer meeting, but I forgot to tell you all that in the sermon. If you don't forgive people, you don't get none. If he could have just not said that one. I don't want to give you all the wrong idea about me. You probably have a lot of wrong ideas about me already, but I'm not going to try. I'm trying not to give you another one, but I do read the scriptures looking for an easier way. How are you reading now? Because if I can find it, I'll share it with you. I can't find it. He's got it sealed up pretty tight. There's a few paths that we are all obligated to walk through. One of those he mentioned earlier. Once in a while, you're going through the valley of the shadow of death, buddy. 
I don't care what the new beliefs are that when you get in Christ, there is no suffering, there is no pain, and there is okay, whatever. You shall walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But when you're there, don't worry about it. It's like he says those things and kind of nonchalantly. Yea, when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, your life is in mortal danger. Don't worry about it. Whoa, back up. Back up. Back. Jesus, please, can you calm down here a little bit? What's this stuff about shadow of death and me having to go through things? Maybe y'all don't pray like that, but I kind of tend to. When we're going into situations, I see that Jesus in the garden... He said, Father, if it be your will that I don't take this cup. But let's don't do my will. I would do your will, but are we sure this is the only way? This is him now. This is him talking. Who am I saying him? The King of Kings, him. Like, there's no name greater than his name. And he was like, whoa. This is a big one. Can we, can we not do this? Yeah. It's okay to be real with God. It's totally okay to be real with God. If you want to be a little more discreet and just apply a little niceness when we're talking to me, I'm okay with that. But when we're talking with God, we need to be real. Genuine. Like the, Jesus told a, an illustration about two men that went to prayer. One came up front. He was like, Father, I thank you that I'm just so awesome. <laughs> My life's good. I've got a good family. I've been able to raise them very good. I tithe all the time. You know, Lord. You know how good I am. And I'm adding to his prayer a little bit. It's okay. It's the same principle. I fast twice a week. Me and you... We're just like buddies. Another guy's at the back. He wouldn't even come in really and sit down. His head's down. His hand's on his chest. And he's like, Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And I'm sorry for bothering you. I'm going to go now. He didn't even... Nothing. He just... You know, if you were the preacher, you'd be like, poor fella. He comes in every week, does the same thing. He just don't get it. That's our, our viewpoint, right? Yeah. Jesus said, that guy went home more justified than this guy. Somewhere along the way, we need to adjust our eyes to see what God sees. I can't figure out for the life of me why Jesus forgave that lady. And I'm a preacher. I'm supposed to have that all figured out before I begin to talk about it to you. That's the beauty of the gospel to me is I don't have to have it figured out. I just have to believe it and I'm winging it most of the time. And all of a sudden somebody will be like, hey, this would be better. And I'm like, oh, you're right. And so you just kind of, this is a better place to stand here. Jesus, Jesus is like, is anyone accusing you of doing that sin that you did? Mm-mm. All right, I'm not going to accuse you either. And they both knew what would happen if Jesus accused her. She would be found guilty. He let her walk. The righteous judge of the universe let her walk. Do we think we're better than him? Am I saying that it's okay to let people sin? Absolutely not. I'm saying the manner in which we bring them back to God needs to change a little bit. Because it's not working how we're doing it. We've got to change something. We're, we're losing too many souls. We can attempt to blame the devil. because He does play a factor in there. Okay. At the same time, we've been told how to defeat him. This young woman that I was talking about, 12 years, we're just at our wit's end. We don't know what to do with her. We love this person. We were there when she was a baby. When you see someone grow up in the natural and in the gospel, and then they walk away, you just, oh no. 
Hopefully that's your response. Some people just do this. I ask you not to do that, please. There are people that I'm not sure are going to make it if we don't help them. I heard T.L. Osborne say one time on a tape, somebody gave me a tape series by him, and it struck me. And by cassette tape, I know I've put myself in a certain age bracket. That's okay. Some of the younger people don't even know what that is. I showed my kids one day a cassette tape, and they're like, hey, what's that? (laughs) And I was here before those. Whoa. Yes. When I was a little kid, my parents had an 8-track in the car. I'm glad we don't have those anymore. Now y'all made me lose what I was thinking. Oh, T.L. Osborne. T.L. Osborne one time said, I am so thankful that I'm reaching the people in the world that God asked me to reach. He said, people come to me all the time and say, I'm glad you're out there working, Mr. T.L., because you're getting all these people saved. He goes, "Uh uh-huh, uh-uh. I'm reaching the ones that God asked me to reach. He goes, but I see that you're failing in the ones you're supposed to reach. And when he said that on that tape, he wasn't speaking to me, obviously, because I wasn't there when he was... But when that word hit my heart, I was like, oh my goodness, that is true. What if that's the way it is? What if God's like assigning a certain amount of people for each one of us to do? And we've just, we've just put all of the homework on the pastor. But what if there are literally people that, 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 that Brother Rhodes is not supposed to reach you are? Right. What if there are people that I'm not supposed to reach or that I can't reach? Like Brother Manny was saying earlier, he, it's like it resonates how I speak to him. When I speak to him, he hears what I'm saying, but some of you don't. And it's, it's okay. It's just a fact. Sometimes people get up and preach and I'm just like... Scratching my head, I don't get it. And you see the person over next to you, and they're like scribbling, and they're like, whoa, man, yeah. And they're looking at you, this is so cool. And you're just kind of like, I'm not sure he's speaking English. I'm not getting anything out of this. It's because the something, there's a connection. That person over here was supposed to hear what that guy's saying at that moment. And you're along for the ride that day. It's okay. That's what I was saying earlier. Sometimes you come to church and your son sees Jesus and you don't. But you know what? When my son saw Jesus, I was so happy. I was brought to tears because I need my son to see Jesus. That was his day to see Jesus. And I was so blessed that he saw Jesus. I was like, God, let him see Jesus more. If I have to give up my next turn... It's okay. I want my son and my daughter and my wife to know Jesus. Paul said, if it were possible, I would allow myself even to be a curse so that I could win others. I'll be honest with you. I'm not quite there yet. That I would be allow myself to be a... Nah. <laughs> But Paul had gotten to an even better place than, than even where I'm at right now. I'm speaking the truth to you. I'm not there yet. Don't ask me to be cursed for you because it's not happening. I'm also not at that place where God was where he was willing to give his only begotten son. Don't touch my son. I love you. Don't touch my son because then I might not love you as much. And that might get ugly. So I'm not to the place where I need to be yet. And I can admit that to you. And sometimes I I'd say stuff to people and they look at me like, you're not supposed to say that. Yes, I am. Yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. Amen. If more people would be honest about where they really are, we could get something going here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There's some areas in my life where I'm just flatlining. I need help. I don't want you to come up and counsel me tonight. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Please don't. 
I'll say stuff while I'm preaching sometimes and someone will come up to me afterwards, well, I have the answer for you, brother. <laughs> I try to be nice. I really do. The thing, he reminded us again that I spoke earlier. I shouldn't have said nothing. Now he's repeating me. Be gentle. Be kind. No. Why don't you be quiet? <laughs> you can't say that to someone, though, at church. You have to be like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hear you. Do me. I'll write that down. Yes, I will. Thank you so much. You try not to lie, but really, you look at their life and they're like, that's not how I want to be in three years. No. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I really am try. I try not to be come off too cynical, but I've really been going to church a long time. Some of us need to lighten up a little bit. Jesus forgave an adulterous lady, and she didn't even ask for it. How can... Yeah. <sighs> really? <laughs> he should have laid down the law on her. But you know what's even worse? We don't know if she walked it out or not. She exited stage right. No more mention of her. And that is life. Sometimes when you pour out your heart to people and you work with them and you forgive them and you get them to a place and you're like, all right, try to walk it out. And they just walk away from God and you. And they talk bad about all that you did for them. Whoa. Shadow of death. Big valley. Just remember, don't unpack. Keep walking. When you find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of decision, the valley of dry bones, just keep walking. Because God's with you and God's walking. He's moving. He's not going to build a house there. Keep going. I find that Jesus was really more likely to forgive than not. My dad told me something one time. He said, give people a lot of rope and let them decide what they do with it. Some people decide to hang themselves. And I don't mean commit suicide. I mean they decide to mess up their life, but it's them deciding to do it. Just keep giving them rope and tell them, look, you need to stop. But you do what you're going to do. I'll give you that one for free. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Wow. We were in Africa last year. And the ministry that we were working with, they like to do outreaches and they get permission. They send a team ahead to get permission from the tribal leaders and all that. And it's good. And then you go spend the night out on the ground in a tent You know what? Some of y'all pay money to go spend the night on the ground in a tent. You know they made beds, right? After the invention of the bed, there's really no reason to sleep on the ground. I'm just saying. That's... But, when you go somewhere like a small village in Africa... There's not enough beds to go around. The people don't even, some of them have beds, and they've been sleeping on the ground for generations. It's that way in Mexico. One of my dear friends in Mexico, he's between 80 and 100 somewhere. And, you know, that sounds funny that I would say that, but he doesn't have a birth certificate, so I'm kind of guessing. He was old when I was a child. He's older now. I don't know his age. He keeps getting sick and God keeps healing him. And he told my son recently, he's like, I think I'm going to stick around just a little bit longer so I can train you. I was like, that is such an honor because he helped train me. And 
he looked at my son. He goes, I was getting weak and I was thinking about asking God if I could go on. He said, but I see you're trying. I'm going to train you. I was like, whoa, what an honor. Wow. Now I lost what I was talking about. What was I saying about him? His name's Brother Ermilo. He's really a good friend of mine. He was telling me something. And I went over to him somehow. Oh, that's what it was. He told me that when he was a kid, before they knew Christ, before they knew anything, he said they didn't have even a table in their house to eat on. They had one chair, and that was for the dad to sit in when he would come home from the fields. Everybody else would just gather stones or something to sit on. So there are places in the world where people genuinely got it rough. Sometimes we imagine that our life is rough. And you hear people say, my life's so rough. And I'm like, you got a bed? Yeah. You have chairs? Mm Mm-hmm. You have a job? Yeah. Hmm. Sounds pretty good. Let us be more aware of, of, of life, real life. There's people right now that don't have beds. And I'm not trying to start a bed drive. Let's all get a bed for someone. No, I'm just saying, we could slow down the complaining a little bit. When we got there to where we're staying yesterday, Miss Naomi said, I'm sorry about the bed. I'm like, I get a bed. That's literally how I feel about it. I get a bed. Thank you so much. I like beds. The floor is not as much, my friend. I try to be friends with the floor. It's just, it hasn't been working out for us. Some of you are like, this dude's really crazy. Spend some days on the floor. You'll understand what I'm talking about. Certain bones in your body don't agree with laying on the ground. I have a couple of those bones that don't agree with the ground. But we were in Africa, in this village. There was a bunch of us there doing an outreach. We showed the Jesus film. We're doing all this work. We're reaching out to people. It didn't seem like it was working. Like I mean, like hardly anybody responded. We couldn't even get them to come up for prayer, hardly. Oh, it's one of those nights where it just seems like, what happened? Somebody forgot to pray or something. But you understand those nights happen. The next morning they said, let's go house to house. Let's divide up into teams of six or eight people. There was a bunch of people there. And let's just go house to house and everybody, let's spread around the village and let's look for sick people to pray for and see what God will do. That's a really good idea. That might even work in Mount Crawford. I'm not sure if God would do that here, but, you know, if you were to try it, I'm not sure. That was kind of a joke. Yes, I'm pretty sure it would work if you did it. So we go, and I was with my dad's team, because I go with him a lot. I got put on his team. My wife did. I think my son was there. And there were some Africans there. It was cool. We had had coffee, so it was an okay day. <laughs> some days you don't get coffee. and You just got to you just gotta be strong. And you just got to have some more courage and more faith. Because it is possible to survive without coffee. <laughs> It's possible. It is so possible. It's almost like a fast, but it is possible. I'm speaking y'all's language now. You're responding a little better. So we get to this house, and this kid was uh, not there so to speak like he was just kind of sitting there like catatonic they said that when he was I think he was 21 
or 24, somewhere in there. He was a young man. And when he was in his 10, 12 years old range, they would sent him to the well to draw water. And when he came, they, they, he didn't come back on his own. A neighbor brought him back. Somewhere between the house and the well, which wasn't all that far, something happened. And they believe it was witchcraft. It probably was. To where he's, his mind was changed. He went from being a relatively normal young kid to he just simply wasn't there. Like he was... He just was sitting there. And they said many times, because of how such extreme poverty they, uh, there is in the area there, that sometimes they will just abandon a child like that. But this family really, really loved him, and they took care of him. And he was healthy looking, because like he didn't even like eat when they would bring food. They would put food in his mouth, and he would chew and swallow. But he didn't, beyond that, he was complete care. Like 100% care. They would take him to the toilet and he would do toilet. But it's like he kind of like, a part of him was just kind of on autopilot. But he just was for years and years and years. And they did not know Jesus. And we showed up at this house. And I know that it was God that led us there. Because why wouldn't God lead us there? As I shared with you earlier, it is God's will for us to help people and try to get them healed and fixed. I don't have to ask that. It's not whether it's God's will or not. It's, are we going to get this job done today? Am I in the right place in God that, that it's going to it's gonna work? And I'm not taking the responsibility off of God, but Jesus commanded us to heal the sick. And so we have to figure out what that means. Sometimes God heals someone. We'll be in a service. It happened recently in somewhere in Europe. I can't remember where. I'll just say the whole continent because that's where we were. We were in service and someone was just healed. Just healed in the service. And, and you're like, did anyone pray for her? Did anyone t- touch her? Is she? Are we going to let God do that? Sometimes that's how He operates. Amen. Which I'm so thankful when he does, because obviously we missed it. But it kind of upsets me too, because I would like to have been there. I would like to have been hearing God enough to where when he's like, hey, I want that lady healed, that I would have been on the job. That means I missed it. Mm. That day we didn't though, thankfully. We're in this village. This little kid's just kind of just there. I say kid. He's in his 20s. He was just not there. And we began to share the gospel with this family, tell them how God loves them and that Jesus heals. And they kind of, you know, they're, they're of the Muslim faith and they don't know too much about it. They hadn't really had much exposure to the gospel. They didn't know what we were talking about. They weren't against us. They were just kind of trying to hear what we're saying. And they were very appreciative that we would come to them and visit them and all that. It was not a uh, like an antagonistic kind of thing. They just didn't know what we were talking about. And there are a lot of people probably in Virginia that are going to be that way when you encounter them. If you begin to share your faith with them, they're not going to fight you. They're just going to look clueless. They're going to have like a big question mark over their head because they just simply don't understand what you're saying. And that's when we need the Holy Spirit to guide us, to help us to answer the question that's above their head. Don't turn them into your enemy by keep pushing on them. Get with the Holy Spirit and figure out what they need. I'll give you that piece for free too. So they let us pray for this kid. And we prayed for him. And nothing happened. That's not what you're expecting. But many times that's the case. When we first pray, nothing happens. And you don't pull your faith back. You just say, all right, let's pray again. We prayed again. Didn't see anything happen. So by this time, they're more interested because we're showing care for their son that they truly love that has this problem. 
And, we, and the people that were translating, they were like, would you like to accept Jesus into your home? And they were like, I think we do. Because they were just, while we were there, was, you, you could see it just coming up. They, could, they were receiving the love that we were trying to give them. And it was just like, they were changing in front of us. You remember? It was just like, I was watching them like, okay, you don't always see that happen like that. Just like, like the realization and that like understanding was coming on them. And you could just see their countenance changing. And I was like, whoa. God's trying to do something here. And we didn't see the kid change. So I was like, okay. And we go to the next house and we prayed for this lady and we went to the next house and prayed for another person. We ended up... Oh yeah, yeah, they took us because they liked how this was feeling because the dad was like, when y'all, when I prayed with you and you touched me, he said, I feel alive inside here. He said, I've always felt just dead and empty. He said, now I feel alive. He said, can I take you to my sister's house? And we're like, absolutely. So we walked across the village a little ways and we talking to the sister and, and they ended up wanting prayer and all this. And then they're like, hey, we got a friend over here that's sick and would you go pray for them? And we're like, that's why we're here. So we're going now. It's like as we go to each place, they're receiving us and they're like, but we know someone else. And we finally just ran the time out that we were allotted. I think it was like three or four hours that we were given to do something with. And we had visited just a few houses. It was a, it was a good sized place. And so we go back to the thing. We start breaking the camp down and, and the leaders there heard about what was going on and, and, and they were like, but what happened with the boy? And we're like, well, the family got born again. And, and then all of a sudden, this guy walks up, an African fella. And he's like, y'all hear about what happened? No, we didn't hear about what happened. Well, after we left, the kids started eating. And we were like, uh-uh, no way. Because we didn't see anything. And so they were like, the leaders of the outreach were like, okay, let's go by there and see. So we're like, well, I'm going too. Because <coughs> my dad's a very inquisitive person. So he's like, I'm going to go see. I heard that something was happening. I want to see it. And so well, I said, well, I'm going too. And so my wife went too and my son went too. So now there's a whole crowd, like 20 people now. Because if God's moving... We should be interested. Like I said last night, it's childlike. When a child sees something out of the ordinary, they're going to key on it. They're going to be looking. What you got there? I've noticed something. In a church or in a, in a, in a group, when you're in someone's house, you never see as many children as there are unless you crack open a bag of M&M's. <laughs> If there are children within a hundred yards and you crack open a bag of M&M's, they start being like, I heard that. I heard that. What's going on here? They didn't tell me that the M&M's were coming out. You have to be careful when you're opening your M&M bags or you're not getting any. Because the adult always has to give up to the child. That's what I was saying last night about being like a child. When something's going on in the spirit, we need to be aware of it. Yes. And can be like, God, what are you doing now? Can I be a part? What can I do? Can I have some? Can I have a piece of that? Can I do that too? I saw that man heal someone. I saw when this fellow came through our church, he had this anointing. Can I have that too? Almost to where we're pestering God. Yeah. We're afraid to do that. And he's like, that's what I want you to do. Jesus kind of had a story about the unjust judge and everybody takes that story in 50 different directions. But what I got out of it, his father loves when his children talk to him day and night. He just loves that. And he's like, give me a minute. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah, but how about now? <laughs> we'll get to it in a minute, son. Now? Because <laughs> I'm still not healed. And sometimes we ask the Father and we don't see the healing and we stop asking. And God's like, I thought you wanted to be healed. Well, I, I did. 
We get a wrong attitude. Yep, yep, that's right. We have to be persistent, persistent, persistent. Because there are things that God allows us to ask for, but he don't always gonna, He's not always going to give it to us when we want it. He's got a time. He's got a, there is a rhythm to it that, that we need to try to figure out and flow with that. And, and dance to the music that God's playing. Get to the beat of what God's doing. Figure out what He's doing. And when He steps, we step. It works so much better. So we went to see this house, and now the family is they're beaming, they're smiling, which they're still, they don't have a bed. They still struggle at times to put food on the table. Why are they smiling? And we show up, we walk around the corner, and this kid, they gave him a bowl of food, and he's just. And I was like, oh my goodness. That. God did that. And he was smiling. And then the mama sitting right there beside him. She is just like, can't, I don't know that you could smile bigger. And they said something in their language and they're like, oh, for real? And I'm like, what? Watch this. And the mama goes, say mama. And he said, mama. He hadn't spoken in like, Ten years. And before we ended up leaving that second time, I think he had said three or four words. He was turning on. We got to see God take someone that was completely... I don't know where he was. I don't know what that even is called. It was some kind of... They had taken him to doctors and everything. They just they, they didn't have an answer. It was some kind of witchcraft thing that... He got, I don't know, as a child he he was at the wrong place at the wrong time or something. I don't know. I don't have that answer. I know that we came across a problem and that time we were able to pray and see a marked improvement. To where now he's feeding himself. He's, He's showing emotion. He's smiling. He's saying a few words. And I was like... And like I said, I've gone to thousands of church services and prayed for probably tens of thousands of people. And and still, when God does something, you should be in awe. Because that ain't normal. (laughs) It's not normal. In the sense of right here on earth. When God moves and you're like... Wow, that's you, wow. We're just looking at each other. Wow, wow. That's who God is. He's, he's someone who wants to forgive. No, Jesus wasn't happy with that lady living in sin. Come on. He wasn't okay with that. But that lady, that day, that was the way to fix her. Yes. We try to look for how to win souls. There's a book on that. It's five steps to winning souls. And we got people in a cookie cutter pattern. And the problem is, is that pattern probably only works with about 1% of the population. It does work. But it's not, we're going to reach the majority of folk. We're not going to be effective at changing our communities and our counties if we're going on some kind of set pattern that someone wrote in a book a while back. That's right. It'll reach some people. And if some people that you're, is what your goal is, that's fine. I want to see change. I want to see a difference in a community. I want to see healings happening more often. We do see them from time to time. And I'm so thankful for that. So thankful. But I don't want to get it to be less frequent. I want to get to the place where when Jesus went to a town or a village or a community, it says, and when he left there, everyone was healed. It doesn't say, and all the believers were healed. It says, everyone was healed. I'm like, God, I'm reading this verse here about what your son did. Can I do that? We're still in negotiations on that one, but I'm working on it. 
But we have to learn to ask the questions. We have to learn to say, God, how do I handle this one? And even sometimes you get thrust into a situation and you're like, okay, yeah, <clears throat> I have no precedent for this one. I'm not really sure what to do. And I don't know why God let me come here instead of Pastor Malin. Yeah. That's in the moment where we're really good about listening. We start hearing, okay, Holy Spirit. We're talking to him all of a sudden. He's like, yeah, where were you yesterday? <laughs> I'll help you out. But I want some, we've got to get more frequent with our talk so that we can understand each other better. So you need the Holy Spirit because sometimes you come up on a situation and you need the wisdom that God carries with him. And you need to be able to hear what he's saying. Like Jesus at that moment is looking at this lady. And you can kind of feel the pauses in there. Where it's like they brought the lady and Jesus is ignoring them. They're continuing to talk. There's a pause there. Jesus is just not saying anything. What's he doing? He's not just scribbling on the dirt. I think he's listening to the voice of the Father. Like, what are we going to do with this one? Yeah. And then he stands up and says, like, Alright, I have one thing first. Let's deal with the religious part. And he pretty much blasted the religion out the house. <clears throat> if I'd have even been part of the crowd, I might would have taken off at that point too. Because, <laughs> oh, Yeah, that was too much there. <laughs> that was a little bit real there, Jesus. <laughs> no sin, huh? Okay. And then he's still thinking... There's another pause there. Everybody left. He's still drawn in the dirt. Then he stands up. What am I going to do with this lady now? We can't ignore it when someone is thrust into our life. I know. Good point. You're there now. And sometimes it seems like you feel like you're out of your league here. I don't know what to do now. This is when we need a really close relationship with God. And you'd be listening. And the lady might even be like, What are we doing? Just, just give me a minute. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Is anybody accusing you now? What's going on? I mean, what are we doing? Mm hmm. It's all good. And, you know, as I'm reading this story, I'm like, Lady, you. This is where you get on your knees. This is where you cry on his feet. You wipe like the other lady did. <laughs> Wiping his feet with your hair, that kind of thing. And she's just like, mm -mm. Accusers all left. You chased them off. <laughs> <laughs> and Jesus was like, okay, that's how we're going to do it today. Today, I'm not going to condemn you. But, stop it. And she took off. She's all better now. I don't have any doctrine to put on that right there. And do you know how many times Jesus stepped outside of doctrine? Just about every time he did anything. Blind man comes up to him. Peter, watch this. I can only imagine him saying something like that because it got weird for a second. Okay. He spat on the ground. He bent down and started putting his fingers in the spittle. Okay, that's gross. He makes mud. He picks this mud ball up. He smears it on the guy's eyes. He's blind. Poor fellow. <laughs> and then he looks at him and says, you got mud on your face. Why don't you go wash it? <laughs> and there's a certain pool I want you to go to to wash it. So he went. He didn't say he led him there. He just said, you got mud on your face. Go wash it. <laughs> I told you I have a different way of looking at the scriptures than, than most because I, I'm reading this story I'm like you spat on the ground I'm getting like I want to vomit here you put spit mud on the dude's face how 
I've, I've had people that have eye problems and are blind before come before me and at not one time did I think spit. <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't see them all healed. <laughs> I don't know. It just seems weird. He went and washed his face. He could see. The other guy, he just skipped some mud entirely. He just spat on him. <clears throat> Again, I, I don't have a slot, a nice, neat slot to put when thou shalt spat upon the <laughs> Jesus continually just kind of stayed outside the safety zone. And then I'm supposed to be like him. What does that look like? I do have an answer. I don't know. <laughs> That's a lot of praying we're going to have to do, ain't it? A lot of prayer. But sometimes in, during that process, you touch someone and a hand comes down from heaven and takes out junk out of their body and out of their soul and just cleans them up for you. And you didn't see it really. You're just kind of like, oh God, I hope I didn't kill her. <laughs> yeah. But God's in the middle of you worrying about if you just killed them. He's just going, don't worry about it. I got it. Just back up for a minute and let the master do his work. Sometimes he, he just wants us to be a part of the startup process and then he's like, all right, you did your part. Let dad handle it now. And we should say, thank you. Yeah, you go. Look what God's doing. He don't even need me no more. Earlier he needed me. Some of you got it. It's okay. You didn't have your coffee this evening. You're worried about sleeping tonight. God really loves us. Amen. He does ask us to try to live better than we're living. Better than what? Better than where you're at? Yeah. Well, what if I'm doing pretty good? Then He wants better. Until we start hearing the voice say, you my beloved son, I'm pleased with you. We have room for improvement. I haven't heard that yet. It's unfortunate. Sometimes I feel like I'm doing pretty good. But I haven't heard him say that from heaven yet. That's what I'm talking about. You're doing a good job from heaven where everybody hears it. They heard the voice. Everybody heard it. They didn't all know what it was, but they heard it. Some of them said it was thundering. Jesus was like, really? That's what you... Thunder? That was, that's what it sounds like when Father talks. Oh no, that was thunder. Mm. I'm starting to understand why things are the way they are. Because y'all aren't hearing when God speaks. Okay, got it now. Ever since I've started understanding, you got Daniel, you got John the Revelator, you got Jesus. They're starting to say that when the thunders, there's voices. When there's a thunderstorm, I get happy. Because I'm convinced that one day when the thunder starts rolling, I'm going to hear what it's saying. Again, be a little bit more childlike. When there's thunder rolling, somebody's talking in heavens. I might have to seal it up. I'm okay with that. I just want to hear it. Y'all like, you are one strange dude. <laughs> See the quizzical looks on your faces. Do you not ever, I mean, does anything interest you? <laughs> Some of you are just like, mm, yeah, okay, okay. <clears throat> God's just going to have to work to resurrect you. <laughs> You're just dead and you don't even know it. Listen when the thunders. I haven't heard it yet. I will. Every time it thunders, I'm like, 
didn't hear it again. All I heard was thunder. Childlike. Be interested. Be interested in what God's doing. When you see God moving, be inquisitive about it. When you see someone in sin, be quick to forgive them. Whoa! I'll just ask you to do two things that are impossible for the American religious mindset. That's your homework for the next ever how long you live. Be inquisitive and be a lot quicker to forgive. That's all you need to know about the gospel. Well, loving one another, we said that this morning, that was crucial also. There's probably a few things you need to know. But let's get the basics going again. We know how to do the church part. We're not as good at the live it part. When we step out of the church, we get unsure about what we're supposed to do. And, and I'm trying to help you to let's, let's figure this out. Let's get that part going. We got this part going pretty good, I think. I mean, we even get the Holy Spirit coming in here sometimes. This is cool. What I want is after the Holy Spirit shows up here, I want to just take Him by the hand and say, Hey, uh, you want to come spend the night at my house? I got an extra room you can stay in. Really, if you want to live there, I can let you live there for rent free. It's okay. Yeah. You can stay at my house and we can go to church and you can visit our church. But come from my house. Can you stay at my house? Yes. Again, I'm making that very simple, but that's kind of how we need to be. We need to invite the presence of the Lord to our home. We need to invite the presence of the Lord in our car. I love it when I get in my car. And it doesn't happen just like every day. No. But sometimes you turn your favorite song series on and all of a sudden you just kind of feel like, am I going to have to pull over here? Because, wow. You just feel that just, wow. God's presence comes in the car with you and you're like, he's in the car with me. That's how I feel. I love it when God's riding down the highway with me. I love it when He goes to work with me. Yep, I can be everywhere. You don't always just feel it, but you want to invite Him along, okay? Invite Him along with you. Let's don't leave him at church. It gets lonely here when we're not here. It used to be a time where the temple was a place of prayer. Jesus was talking about that. He had that same problem. This used to be a house of prayer. Now it's a den of thieves. Are you saying my house is a den of thieves? No. I'm just quoting Jesus. I heard somebody say one time, if the shoe fits. Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just stop right there. Yeah. We want that everywhere we are, the Lord feels welcome. And we want Him to come check on us once in a while. In a tangible way. I know that he's, he's with us always. But I want to know that He's with us always. And some of that does have to do with how we treat people. Some of that does have to do with our faith levels. It does have to do with our walk with Him. There's a lot of factors involved. But really I think the most important is that we make Him feel welcome. Why do you think it says in Revelations, Behold, I stand at the door and knock? Does the owner of the universe really have to ask permission? But he's a gentleman. He doesn't come in uninvited. I kind of try to let him know we have an open door invitation. He still wants to know. 
So I try to tell him every day, you're welcome. Amen. You're welcome to be whatever you need to do with my life. It's okay. I'm just kind of hoping he doesn't take the coffee. That's going to be a sad day for a little while. I've given it up before. Worst three minutes of my life. <laughs> By how I talk, you would think I drink it every day. I do. Here's why. I'll give you a reason why. A dear friend of mine in Mexico, he's 72 years old, also another man that's helped me to know who I am in Jesus. When my dad found him, he was an unbeliever and he was fixing to kill people. He was just a very mad, angry, been a, ripped off. His family had been robbed and all this kind of stuff that is a normal, I need Jesus story. And my dad found him because God was directing their paths to be together. And, and, and there was a great healing happened in their family. <clears throat> and he decided that Jesus was the way to go. And you know what? God took all that hate from him. He smiles almost more than anybody I've ever met. He's just a lovely man to be around. And I asked him one time how much water he drinks. I don't know why that came up. And he just looked at me very, very seriously. He goes, why would I drink water when there's coffee? I'm like, because it's not really healthy? I don't know. That's what they're telling me. Is that not true? Because you know, him being 72, I can listen to his judgment. <laughs> and he said, I have been drinking eight cups of coffee a day since I was 16 years old. And I'm healthier than you are. I said, you got a point. <laughs> That's my friend. He taught me. I don't drink eight cups a day. Don't worry. <laughs> don't. I try, but I don't usually make it. I know I'm causing trouble for some of you. It's okay. <laughs> but Manny, you need to calm down. You're me out, brother. You need to calm down a little bit. Let's learn from Jesus. I want you to reread the Gospels again and I want you to meet Jesus again. There's more to Jesus than you know. Every time I read the Gospels, really the whole Bible is that way, but you know, that one part specifically about Jesus is kind of should be your favorite part. <clears throat> When I read that, I see things in his life that I'm like, well, I don't even know where to put that, Jesus. But can you show me how to apply that to my life? Can you show me the people that I'm not forgiving that maybe I should go ahead and forgive? And that will release them into the life of the gospel without them even... They don't even know that's what they're doing, some of them. All of a sudden, they just kind of are there. And they're like... Wow, I really love Jesus now. I didn't really love him before. You know, some of these innocent looking people and they're like, you know what, before you met me, I've had people tell me this before. Before you met me, uh, I was about ready to kill someone. Really? It wasn't me, right? No, but I was going to kill someone and I was thinking about, I was meditating on this and then y'all brought me the gospel and now I'm not going to kill them. Ooh, that's good. There's one brother and another friend of mine. He's, he's gone up in the mountains. He's left his tribe of people. He's working with a different tribe. When he was in a very bad place, his marriage was really in a rough place, a man that was from the church invited him to a meeting. He came to church and, and, and he heard the gospel really for the first time very clearly. And that night, the, the, he went back to, to his home. He had to walk like three hours. An unbeliever walked three hours to go to church because someone invited him. That is so weird. 
but it, were, it was his time. And he said that night, he was just like, he said, I felt like I was fighting with God, like wrestling. Like, it was almost like what happened with Jacob. And he's like, all night I was in turmoil. And this, this, he said, it was just the worst night of my life. And he said, but at morning time, I decided, fine, you can have me. And his mom had been given a Bible many years before and she had given it to him and he had just put it in his dresser drawer way at the back. He didn't want nothing to do with it. He goes, I dug that thing out and began to read. He said, and I read all morning. I went back to the church. He walked another three hours to go find this. No, the pastor the next day had come to their village and they were going to have, they was just planting a church there. And he said, I went to the meeting. He said, I found the guy. And he said, I need this Jesus. He said, but what nobody knew is at that point in my marriage, he said that him and his wife talked later. They didn't know this about each other, but they were both planning to murder the other one. Oh, wow. Wow. The marriage was not in a very safe place. It wasn't like one was, they were both so angry that they were both thinking about how I'm going to kill my spouse. That was in, I think he told me, in 1999. This is 2017. They're still married. They still didn't kill each other. So it was very timely. And there's people that God's going to put in your path that you need to be on, on point and just, just be there and say, Hey, it's okay. God loves you. I want you to know He's ready to forgive you. That might be, you might have saved someone's life in that moment. That's who we are. That's who we are. Yes. We are the body of Christ. Yes. That's who we are. <clears throat> Let's pray together. And then I want to honor what Pastor Malin said. I would like for you to come up by families. Let us lay our hands on you. We're not going to take all night. We're going to be back here in the morning again. But I want to, I want to touch each family. Amen. And let's ask God to bring healing. Because there has been hurts. There has been... Drama, there's been all kind of things going on. The enemy's looking for different ways to come into your life right now. And we need to plug all these holes up. And we need to block his access to this church. Amen. We have the right to do that, so let's work on it. That's right. the, the devil don't have the right to be here. Sinners, though, I'm going to tell you, we've made a mistake by not allowing those guys in. That's a good point. We should be inviting them in and giving them a seat close to the front. They should be getting hugs. I'm not even somebody that likes to hug folks. I'll give them a hug though. If I give you a hug, basically I'm feeling like God had that happen. What? I'm telling you, get past you. Get past you. Get outside of you. Get into Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight again. I thank you for bringing healing to this church. <clears throat> Bring healing to this land, God. We just expect you, God. We expect you to help us because you said you would. We appreciate you giving us the time of day. We appreciate you giving us Jesus Christ. We appreciate the Holy Spirit. We appreciate you for forgiving us, God. Help us to love. And help us to plug the holes that the enemy is trying to put in our camp. Give us a great wall of defense, God. Thank you, Jesus. Set it about us, God. Help, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So if you will... Why don't we come up on this side here and